Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome you. Uh, this is the last event of uh, the, this academic year, and it seems to hit at the time when apparently a lot of papers are due and people are, uh, people are worn out at this point of the semester sometimes. So we are grateful for your presence here. Um, very grateful for, um, grateful above all for the presence of the Holy Spirit with us today, and we are confident of that and thankful for that. It's my privilege today to introduce our speaker today, um, M. William Urey. You know, sometimes the Lord brings people into our lives uh, unexpectedly and who make a massive impact. And I can't think of too many people who've made a bigger impact on my life than Bill Urey. Um, I went into, I started, uh, he was my first, first theology professor and I went into his class thinking this is one more class to get through, one more box to check off and before I can get on to being a New Testament scholar. And um, I think that lasted about a week. And after that I realized this is a way to understand the Bible better. This is a way to understand our Lord better. This is a way to understand our Lord's love for us. And this is a way to love the Lord with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. To me, that was a vision of theology that I, that I saw and that I saw embodied and for which I am grateful to this day. Will you join me with prayer and then in welcoming our speaker for today? Lord, we're thankful for this day and for your mercies new each morning, for your grace as soft and gentle as a spring rain, for your care over us, over us, for your watch over our lives, for your presence with us and ministry through your people. And Lord, we're thankful today for this opportunity we have, and we pray that this will be a time in which we are strengthened and encouraged, challenged and enlightened, edified and strengthened. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Yuri? Thank you for being here. My wife, Diane, and I are so glad to, to be here, especially glad to see Tom again and, and Joel, and want to thank Heather and the others who've made our are coming here, such a, a wonderful experience already. Um, I'm not aware of an assignment that has caused me more anxiety than this one, mainly because my student now become my mentor, Tom McCall, asked me to do this, so I knew I had to come and somehow impress him, which is impossible to do. But um, I think, and I know this is a pastoral meeting, that as a pastor and as a theologian, uh, at least in the past, and uh, as an evangelist in some ways now, I feel with many of you the kind of pressures that uh, come with this idea of creation and the, and the glut of information that we receive all the time, trying to apply that to, to life and ministry. When Tom contacted me with the invitation, I knew it was a remarkable invitation for me personally. But I had not been in an academic setting like this for about seven years. And uh, so I did what any frantic thinker would do. I scurried to the nearest seminary library I could find. Where else can you find the depositum of all wisdom and ultimate truth in a seminary library? But uh, in that security of that fortress building, they all seem like fortresses to me, I uh, clicked on the word in the search bar, the word creation, and up came 961 books on that topic alone. So uh, my first thought was, well, I better get started uh, a year ago. And that was, of course, unadulterated arrogance. So I come today, a year later, out of pure, I think it's in good Templetonian foundational form, chastised in ab abject humility. Uh, I have been catalyzed by every lecture, every article that I have found on the website. I know you as pastors are incredibly grateful for that and students as well. Uh, it's one of the most incredible treasure troves I know of in terms of, of insight. I think every time I listened to a, one of the articles or uh, lectures or read an article, I thought, I'm just glad I'm on the same team as this person. I may be the water boy on this team, but I'm glad I'm on the same team as these brilliant people who have shared. Joel has been my contact. I think he walked me off the cliff a couple times 
uh, like Beatrice to Dante, you've guided me through to find where I might fit in this lecture. So I hope that what I share uh, is profitable. I've spent 40 years in academia, and five years uh, before our present ministry, Diane and my ministry, as lead pastors in a church. So just hearing the word science as a pastor produces in me a, a, a feeling of a variety of responses, things that could possibly shift overnight. I think the news just this morning said they, we've seen for the first time a black hole. Well, I wonder what's going to come from that remarkable insight, uh, 88 trillion miles away. Um, uh, all kinds of things. I think I read last week where a guy in Nevada dug a ditch and he said, I now have found the exact 24-hour period when the dinosaurs died. It was 66 million years ago, he says. So in light of all that, in ministry, I, I like you, have to, have to chart my way. Uh, a rock that is found now somewhere, a pile of rocks on Mars. One of those rocks we say now I found is from the Earth which was deposited there 4.1 million years, notice not 4.2, 4.1 million years ago on Mars. Well, maybe. But as a person, Christian, minister, I find myself in a cyclone of claimed truths that I've got to make some sense of for the people I minister to. We move from the geological this morning to the anthropological, and I think that they are, they are connected. Also in mid-February, I know none of you missed this, this, this bill that came up in New York that was advocating the actual slaughter of a one-day-old baby as a, as a possible concept in American culture. So personhood, its origins, and its meaning become radically important no matter where you start, 4.1, 66 million, or a day after birth. Personhood is a foundational concept that we all must engage with. I must say a word, too, being in the, the Carl F. H. Henry Center, in some sense, that I, 40, 40 years ago exactly, began to read Carl Henry's work. I never finished it. It was too much to read. But I, I began reading God, Revelation, Authority, and found my life entirely, my theological method transformed and supported by his voluminous brilliance. Um, and I think, I know for sure, his focus on inerrancy was compelling enough, and it's theocentric, order for me to, to say for most of my teaching that his systematic principle of a divine transcendent disclosure to this very day forms the way I read the Bible and teach it and preach it. I'm so glad for this seminary. I'm glad for this center. I'm glad for all that's happened here, and I pray the Lord's richest blessings upon you. I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for so many things. Now, I know I need, know I need to dive in here, but I, I just wanted to to say thanks again and to, and to make sure that uh, you as pastors know that I, I feel where you are and I pray that you and I will be able to help each other in the days to come to make these things as clear as possible to our people as we learn. Number one, the move from modernity to postmodernity has meant at least two major shifts in self-perception. The modern era inaugurated an unprecedented preoccupation with the self that with the result of an egocentricity that re became an intractable solipsism, so entrenched that now we're dealing with the deconstruction of the self. The dilemma of all conce concepts of the human person without an understanding of createdness as personal and personal self-giving, no matter how philosophy describes it, is inadequate. We are no longer able to comprehend personal meaning. The basic questions of all ministry, all of life, who am I? Why am I here remain, for most people, conundrums. I would challenge anyone here to offer to me a place where I could find a sufficient definition of personhood in any science, any scientific regime at all. Biblical anthropology is not found in that discussion often. That's why this discussion in these years is so crucial, I find. When I began reading um, Carl Henry, about the same time in life, I, I bumped into Francis Schaeffer. And his response to those who accused him of straying from preaching the simple gospel by engaging reigning philosophies, he said, well, I've got to do this because people don't know who they are. Take this famous quote, man is lost, man remains a zero. This self-curvature is the damnation of our generation, the heart of man's problem. Then referring to the doctrine of creation, he stated, but if we begin with a personal beginning 
and this is the origin of all else, then the personal does have meaning, and man and his aspirations are not meaningless. I think his statement is just as true today as it was 40 years ago. What does it mean to be human? What's it mean to be a person? The explosions of scientific discoveries have produced, in many Christians' minds, a deep anxiety. We want to learn all we can about the complexity of humanness, but there are areas that the sciences simply aren't able to explore or explain. So where do we go? We look at various anthropologies, and I began to look at this a bit as my year began, and I soon stopped because it was overwhelming. Neuroscience, neurobiology, substance dualism, psychological schools, evolutionary psychology, social psychology, social genetic engineering, and and even cloning to this day, just to name a few for us as Christian thinkers and ministers. All of those beg the question of personhood, humanness. But there's no agreed upon definition. And what is proffered is woefully inadequate to meet the cry for ultimate meaning. None of those sciences ground their thought in Genesis 1 and 2, overtly. And if you don't, what are you left with? Now, like most here, I have a tempestuous relationship with sciences overall. I'm grateful for every benefit of ongoing research, but at nearly every point, the traditional conceptions of created person have been challenged deeply. Creation of Adam is a challenge. The main thrust has been to define and to distinguish ever increasingly minute components of humanity, which is profitable. But we are fed a constant definitional diet of cognitive, conative, and affective traits, which have predominated since Descartes, I would argue even earlier, and we are dealing with that today. Science punctuates characteristics, making those characteristics the sole determiner of humanness, and that cannot be the case. A comprehensive theology, by its nature, attempts to systematize characteristics and essence, structure and nature, elements and ontology. None here can question the pressing need for what this project aspires to catalyze. And I am so grateful for what's going on here. I find my present quandary reminiscent of the relationship between the academy and the church. There is an implicit mutual suspicion a fear of capitulation to something that might undermine our own cherished perspectives. The church has had handmaidens before, like philosophy, but can we even talk today, connected to science, of any kind of subordinate accountability? If so, in our era, who is subordinate to whom? As Thomas Oden said in his, in his massively important theme, and this is a picture, by the way, of the wall between, I guess, scientists and people in the church or pastors or whatever. I, I see these walls everywhere. Maybe even in this, own, in this, in this three-year uh, endeavor together, we've seen this kind of wall breaking down a bit. We've got to relate to each other. But Thomas Oden says this. He says, there are several things that we need to confront in our modern era, ultra-modern era. An odd deference to reductionistic naturalism and scientific empiricism as the final court of appeal and truth question. Now, he wrote that at least 20, maybe 25 years ago, and it's still true to this day in my area of ministry. This is the constant feel I, feeling I go come up with when new things come across the scene like I just mentioned. I, I confess it's an almost knee-jerk reaction as a pastoral theologian. Must I feel foolish before the cataract of scientized pronouncements regarding everything human, including the increasing technological notion of humanity? Must everything taught on personhood align with the scientific method before it can be acceptable in the church? How do we speak? What is an all-encompassing, intellectually supportable theology of humanity? Worse, I find biblical anthropology, even in institutions of higher education, has become a relic of a receding set of archaic terms that fit best in an ancient, and we're often reminded, unscientific saga or myth. For half a century, we've tried to do theology in light of the Holocaust. I wonder what it would be like, what it's like for us now, if we could talk about this, how to do theological uh, inquiry since quarks. Diogenes Allen says it this way, if the material and the immaterial are divorced by science, then who are we? The origin of the personal. 
is paramount in any account of biblical creation. It is one idea that holds the ever-encroaching subspecies of evolutionary concepts from overrunning the meaning of creation entirely. That is personhood, the personal. The place where science must demur is at this point. What does all this, that is, where, when does all this, that is, become truly personal? What difference would it make in our discussions and agreement if that was the undeniable ground of all of our commitments? Something foundational is lost when we allow theology or science or philosophy, and they all can do this, cloud the revolutionary worldview statement that God is holy and God is love. Both essential claims point to his personal nature and that he only creates, he only produces what issues from his divine personal nature. He can do nothing else. That's who he is. Could that be possibly the inspired intention of the biblical authors in placing the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, at the center of all creation? And you know the passages. All that is, is from him, by him, through him, in him, and for him. But he is not alone in that project. A full rendition of the Scripture's content on all that has been made is that all three persons create and all that is created bears the mark of, their, of that personal love. The panoply of field theories and even chaos theories, which I started to look at and then gladly put down very quickly, reflect a remarkable reality. The more minuscule our scientific investigations become, we do not find atomistic elements. Instead, we're finding, scientists are finding, more fields of interactive, might I say, relational entities. Very interesting to me. Individuation is not ultimate. As small as we go, as atomistic as we, as, as we can become, it is as if all that is, is is foundationally relational in reflecting, I believe, the glory of the three in one. As with every juncture of grace in nature, human person must begin at some point. It is my contention that being made in the image of God is not a processive construct, but it was a marvelous, most likely instantaneous, but above all, truly personal and thus relational reality. At the outset of any Christian view of the creation, we must ask, what truly matters outside the relational? As John Habgood averse, person and mattering are both sides of the same coin. Now, the first contrast in biblical theology of human being is the exalted place humanity is given by the Creator. It's undeniable in contrast to all other origin stories. There's one creation story and all other origin myths, and you know the contrast. Part of that polemical critique, beginning in Genesis 1, the very first few verses, is the line drawn between the creator and creature. Whereas continuity in the ancient Near East between the human and the divine, you know, resulted in a miasma of manipulation and idolatry and power plays and all the rest, Genesis 1 offers us a radically different picture you you've had a, a lecture on this, many, I'm sure, many, many things have come on this, out of this, but I, I believe creation out of nothing is a key in this whole theme of the line between creator and creation. There is no other way to start biblically, sufficiently. Irenaeus began the discussion, but now we've moved much farther along. Creating all out of nothing, God is affirmed as illimitable, sovereignly free, personally pur purposeful in all that he does. Yet... He deigns to be known by us, his image, what, what, which means there's a divine humility at the very source of the grandeur of this astounding distinction. This morning in my devotions, in one of the Messianic Psalms, Psalm 45, reading in verse 4, and we, the, the, the praise to the king read this way, you are moving out in victory, victorious, victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Where else does a king in all of human history get defined like that? Whatever king is being referred to, justice, authority, and humility. The same thing occurs at creation. Though thoroughly orthodox, creation out of nothing can also place an impersonal barrier to richer conceptions of the nature of ultimate reality, if we're not careful. If the Trinity is truly creator, then nothingness becomes the context for holy love to form with his own heart, with his own hands, with personal sovereignty, sovereignty, all that is. So, 
Let me push an envelope just gently. We talk about God not being necessarily a creator, but I want to say it seems to me there's some point we can say that love that is not shared is not love. Divine ontology and creation are bound together by grace, and grace is the, the very life of God. So, as Nazianzus would say, there must be a movement of self-contemplation in God that does not satisfy goodness, but good must be poured out and go forth beyond itself to multiply the object of its beneficence. For this is, was essential to the highest goodness. His argument is goodness must outflow with goodness. Good produces good. Love produces love. Now, we've been reminded how to distinguish necessitarianism from every other kind of, of createdness, but I want to say what is maintained is a view of God that includes a dynamic, divine intercommunication, which is sourced in a self-sufficient and eternal ecstatic love. As its Euless would say, this being is the life of God, a communal being. All that is created comes as a result of the transcendent being. The personal speaks forth. The personal forms. The personal God sustains the natural. It is never the other way around. What is found in the opening paragraphs of Genesis is the self-giving desire to share with his image all these ordained out of an invitation to live with him and in him. In love, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, he predestined us for adoption as his children. But that absolute contingency, the line between creator and creature, creature, creature reveals the imprint that he is the one who makes us. His self-sharing involves in creation, involved in creation is etched into the very essence of Adam and Eve. One cannot read the first two chapters of Genesis without the distinct impression that God is lovingly sharing all that is with Adam and Eve. He invites them into a covenant and comports a vibrant co-creation. Any idea of origins which muzzle that intimacy, obscure that personal relationship, misses the point, I believe, completely. A line between, but now also a love between. A line between, he's creator, we are not, but this incredible love. The creator is looking for a relationship with his image, a relationship based upon mutual self-giving. In a world where humans are view, were viewed as chattel at best, it is a radical notion that the creator of all things might really like to be with those that he has made, love to share life with them. And here I want to emphasize just a moment this creation not as, self, as canonic love. I've noticed that much of the debate on the details of creation revolve around the author's understanding of context, and I would agree. I've read much, as you have, to say that Genesis 1 and 2 were written for farmers 3,500 years ago. It might be helpful in adjudicating the proper interpretation of the meaning of seven vociferously exegeted days of creation. But I also wonder, in the same context, what they heard when they saw the word or heard the word Ruach Elohim. I don't want to say that I know about agrarian nomadic hearers enough to say they would not understand something about the reality of those two words. Days, all right, but the Spirit of God, and that being a plural ending, raises intriguing notions for me. Context is a secure starting place, I, I agree. But it's not a straitjacket, given the progress of, of theological insights which come later and shed retroactive light. I believe the spirit of Elohim draws us into personal mystery immediately. We know that the root of Ruach points to life-giving, invisible, powerful breath or wind. Compounded by a plural form of God, we are introduced to a being whose essence is remarkably interrelated, or at least other-oriented, at the genesis of all things. And that God breathes life into Adam is a direct counterpart to this divine wind, this life-giving force. Person, personal being, insufflates person. This is already a strong statement about pneumatology, about matter-confirming, world-affirming, person-valuing the nature of, of creation as God's superintending spirit, as God who is the spirit. Undoubtedly, light is being cast on the intimate nature of God's own light in the first life, in the first 16 words of the text. The love which is God himself is producing all that is. 
climaxing in the breathing of his own life into his image. He always gives himself. There is no other characteristic or essential statement of God which supersedes this self-giving love, from my reading. I agree with those who desire to place Jesus in relation to creation where the scripture does. But this also must apply to the spirit. We need to be thoroughly Trinitarian in our doctrine of creation. Any preemptive exclusion of the personal at an ontological level makes it a, its appearance secondary and thus, I believe, not necessary. I can't accept that. That God would create by his word is also instructive of the deeply personal nature of the creator. How his creation is to respond to his loving will. To speak, as you all know, is to divulge one's will, one's intention. It's a self-sharing. It's revelation as a subject. It's a form of self-giving, of relationship. It is speech that forms covenant, a relationship of mutual accountability, a relationship that is formed by word, has its origin in Trinitarian conversation. Swain refers to this dialogue in Genesis 2 as with God and Adam as a condescension by God in a, of a direct and interpersonal manner, which results in a generous invitation to accept God's standard for life. Of all the comparisons and contrasts with other origin myths, there's only one creation story, is the relational categories which predominate in the creation story. I want to I lift up several of those. Neither science nor interpretive schools offer us the reason for creation. Purpose is the domain, I think, of theology. Discerning the motivation behind creation informs all else. It's a crucial starting point. The self-deference of the Son of God was not a new act offered to meet us and our need. His incarnation was the expression of the eternal disposition of the heart of the Trinity. The incarnation was preceded by the self-emptying of the three-in-one who condescended to create a world that would be the context of his relationship with human persons. We seldom talk about the humility of God, but creation was at the beginning a canonic self-emptying from my reading. All that God does in relation to us comes out of his eternal heart of selfless love. I think I've heard this phrase used a couple times in our our uh, three years of discussion, creatio ex amore. Creation out of love could be a much more helpful orienting principle, I believe. Now, with those here who've written on analogy, I'm a little bit uh, undone here by diving into this, but let me just say something for those of you who may not have had a chance to think uh, about this for a while. For me, uh, in my discussion of, of personhood, the, the idea of of an analogical language and the use of person is, is produces a lot of chaos. And I can see why. Um, but I want to say that analogy in scripture, so the idea of person, divine person, what that means, how we can talk about a divine person, personal reality, must have some meaning that is true to the scripture and to reality. So my, my small approach to this would be, and I've, I've worked on this, but not as deeply as many of you here, so I'm looking forward to your interaction with me here. Built upon the structure of revelatory mystery, I feel there's an, initi an initiating, ineluctable, yet inscrutable downward movement of grace. That analogy, <clears throat> for us as Christians, takes on, analogy takes on an ontological complexion, which some would claim reflects the character of a triune God. <clears throat> Many modern scholars are repulsed by the inference of a retroactive discernment, meaning we can somehow place personhood on God. I understand the reserve. The stultifying critique is that we are guilty of positing our conceptions of human personhood upon God, which I would not want to do ever. How do we escape such a withering assessment? One hopes that the discussions of person are not an exercise in idolatry. I don't want to be an idolater. Stated simply, I think there are two main schools of thought. You've got the below-above approach, which says there's only one way to talk. You ascend by language to what you think about God. But the other, this downward movement of grace, for me, is the above-below statement, a descending understanding of analogy, that God wants to give to us concepts that point us to him, that help us in understanding his intimate, mysterious nature. The immediate application of these methods to our thesis elicits the question to, of which personhood de defines which. Are we guilty of anthropomorphizing when we speak of divine persons in community? Is that an egregious personalization of the mystery of God, which I want nothing to do with? From the opposite end, does the divine life through the creation of the image in some way truly 
inform, or could I say theomorphize, human personhood. Modern biblical studies reflect these two movements through two major interpretive schools. For me, I'm just summarizing here a lot of material, but I think you find these two. The instrumentalist, which deals with the notion of divine person as purely nominalistic, a manner of speaking, attributing categories of personhood, which border on projectionism. And I hear the criticism. To which the realist school, I think that's where I would be, uh, would respond by saying, you instrumentalists are skeptics. You're reductionistic. You allow no connection between humans and God then. What can we say that's true about God himself in a personal way? For the realist, this downward flow of revelatory grace, the idea of a divine person relating to another divine person would be acknowledged as analogically discovering or heuristic, a product of a successive consensus of biblical interpretation, not intransigent in its best expressions, always open to modification, not irreproachable, but as yet an irreplaceable theological assessment of biblical data, looking for something better waiting for someone to offer us something better. Nothing that I know of yet in an analogy. Divine persons creating human persons. The the philosophical precondition of this camp is based upon the assumption that being precedes action. Verbs require subjects. Creation requires a creator. And what he creates reflects his own personal nature. Hilary Poitier says it this way, Every analogy, therefore, is to be considered as more useful to men than appropriate to God because they only hint at the meaning rather than explaining it fully, which I totally would agree with. It is my argument that there is at the present state, in the present state of theological of reflection, an irreducible truth conveyed by the relational definition of person, however imperfect the term, for which I see no equal re- replacement offered. Now, to point two. Biblical materials for a theological anthropology. The first contact point, I find, again, to refer back to Genesis 1 and 2, is the infinite God is personal. Every indication from my reading of the text, and that may not be large enough for this room, but from my, from my understanding, every indication offers the picture of an absolutely holy and loving sovereignty, sovereign God, creator in every sense of the word, expressed in an ever-increasing set of selfless actions and words. It's no surprise then that the climax of creation is the formation from primarily, from primarily, previously created materials by fiat, Adam, from the dust of the earth and Eve from Adam's side, which Yahweh then calls the transcendent God his image. The transcendent models his own image. The Greek theologians would argue that there is an inherent perfecting telos at the inception, that everything is moving somewhere. G.K. Chesterton has this marvelous quote uh, while he's talking about Thomas Aquinas. He says, if there has been from the beginning anything that can possibly be called purpose, it must reside in something that has the essential elements of person. He sees that from Thomas. I would agree that far with Thomas and, of course, with, with Chesterton. Perhaps it's best to say that in some way good, the good, the word good in Genesis 1, means just what God intended, but that in another sense, goodness entails a motive of love in all things to bring them to their full potential. It is not that anything's wrong, but creation must find both its origin and completeness in God's good intention. Here, goodness, tov, and perfection, tamim, are inseparable. The ultimate purpose of God in all creation is to make his perfect love known. It's interesting with this phrase, as you all have studied and preached and taught, the the, the remarkable paucity of usages uh, for the the phrase image of God, yet how much import understanding of who we are is based upon it. Beyond Genesis 1 and Genesis 9, the phrase image of God is not found in the Old Testament ever again. And in the New, very few references to image or likeness dealing with createdness. We have Christ as image human likeness to God in moral categories, but not the image of God. It was Carl Henry, I remember reading decades ago, who said, the image determines the entire gamut of doctrinal affirmation. And I think my last 40 years, I've just begun to scrape the surface of that kind of sentence. The image determines the entire gamut of doctrinal affirmation. What you believe about the image of God. 
The variety of interpretations over the centuries show both the importance the church has discerned regarding the image, but also its lack of uniform understanding. You know the two major categories. We've got Imago Christi, the image of Christ, created in his image, and created in the image of the Trinity, Imago Trinitatis. I think both are interconnected. The incarnate Christ, the image of God, the perfect image, Hebrews, 2 Corinthians, only he is. We are only ever made in the image. He is the image. We are in the image. Every other thing about the image is a faint but important reflection of his reality. It has been an underlying assessment of all Orthodox theologians that Jesus instantiates the fullness of personhood, both divine and human. He reveals to us at every point the meaning of true personhood. To begin any anthropology without Jesus is to miss the clearest read on the essence of the image in which we are made. The highest and most comprehensive Christian definition of person is that we are meant to image Christ the image. Christ is the image of God and our creation remains, bears a resonance with his being that staggers the imagination if he is present in a person's life. But to place that image discussion in Christ is to immediately affirm a Trinitarian discussion. For Christ reveals to us at every juncture that his being is not of himself. He is from another, and in another, and for another. The language from his conception to his session, in this Lenten season it's hitting me very strongly, from his conception to his session is not a bifurcation of the human from the divine, as if the divine only appears when needed. He reveals the canonic life of God in the flesh. The question remains, how do we as humans image Christ, and in what sense does that reflection of ultimate reality comport with the person of Christ as Son of the Father, who is also eternally in the Spirit? The revelation of God in Christ always is our best starting point. The self-understanding of Jesus, the Son of the Father, He as the Holy One of Israel, the center of another comforter. This One, who is also the Son of David, the Son of Man, shows us immediately what is transpiring in Genesis 1 and 2. It is his fundamental essence. The reality he shares with the Father and the Spirit that brings, sustains, and directs all creation. And the acme of that work is the relationship he desires with the created image. An image contingent, dependent, but reflective of the life he is in himself. So I begin, as all of you do, to come back after science books and challenges and terms and every pastor does this. And I went back to the text, the safety of the scripture, and just began to outline for myself again, what are the relational emphases of Genesis 1 and 2? And we find an amazing, I think, interesting, increasing concept of intimacy. We immediately note that nearly liturgical repetition in one gives way to story in two. Order, structural order, is replaced by a relationship story. Even the names of God indicate a deepening self-revelation. El, Elohim, is now seen most often as the divine personal name of Yahweh. The majestic transcendence so evident in the first chapter is now countered with what might at first be an unsettling imminence, like walking, breathing. But it's normal for God, it's personal, it's intimate. Where the image is the apex of all creation in one, we find they have moved to the central position in two. It is worthy of note that the more generic male-female in one is followed by references to a particular man and woman in two. The unique divine verb bara shifts to the tactile word for forming, which we find also incurring, by the way, in Genesis, Jeremiah 18. God forms out of, the, out of the dust of the earth. While bless is the previous gift of God in one, we find breathing into nostrils in two. The givenness of one is underscored, but we now find in two that Adam and Eve are actually put, they are placed into the garden, indicating an increasing vocational responsibility. Of note, Genesis 1 has no Trinitarian in intimation of mutual relationship or conversation while that are, there appears to be an incipient intra-Trinitarian discussion in the following chapter. For what reason? Regardless of who is involved in that interchange, it is nonetheless undebatable that the only disconcerting thing in all of heaven and earth for the maker is the lack of another person to whom Adam might relate. I find that a fascinating historical note for us. Out of all of creation, one consternation, Adam does not have a partner. Of course, 
is that the communal discourse on the problem? And his solution is, is the lengthiest, stretching from 218 to 225. God is saying, this is a problem I am going to fix. This is not good. Note again in the first chapter, there is no comment of lack. And then a clear, unsur- a surprising statement. No, Lotov, it is not good that the man is without a covenant partner. We must not miss that from a more generic distinction, like our notion of humanity, Yahweh then turns to the Adam, Adam as a personal name and Eve by Adam in 3.20. What is of particular note is that the Selem, the, the image, is used in chapter 1, while living being, a God-breathed person with a soul, is the indication of how the image receives life beyond the merely physical in relationship. So you see my point. I think we're moving from an initial statement, story, whatever you call this, into an ever-increasing understanding of the image's intimacy, not only with God, but within the image's self. As teachers and preachers, we all have taught this to our people, and and I think we're correct. There are three basic areas of the Salem. There are the concrete image. An idol, which occurs many times, other words, of course, for that, but this is one major word. There's the begotten, as in Genesis 5, 3, Seth being begotten of Adam, of Adam, a living reproduction. And the third, the created Adam, the revelatory, intimate relationship that reveals something given from the outside itself. This created image implies both a strong similarity and a compatibility. It possesses uniqueness, a differentiation from the original but its sole purpose is to reflect the source. Let me just say in passing that uh, I know that uh, the word likeness also causes lots of consternation. I don't have any answer just to say my, my take on likeness is that it's not a word that is adding nothing to the discussion. I think that's, that's a wrong take on any biblical word. I think likeness clarifies contingency. It confronts any form of pantheism, disavows any residual notion of divinization, We are only ever like God. He is God and we are not. There's a likeness, a reflection, but we're only contingent, always distinct. Uh, That is a radically divergent uh, uh, point, opinion, where likeness is more than poetic repetition. It offers an epistemic reserve by emphasizing non-identity with the original. So those two words are key for us, but... We also find this image shares in the mysteriously glorious but vibrant personal reality of the, of the Creator. To image Him, made in His image. All of you know this quote, you've used it scores of times, but for me, it seems to be so helpful every time I come across this, by C.S. Lewis, of course. You, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Every person you meet is immortal. That is what the image discussion of Genesis 1 and 2 immediately turn us to. It's an astounding thing that we must ascertain here. Now, the meaning of the image, of course, is what comes next. And I want to uh, outline that by a couple of things, but I want to start by saying there are terms of speech which indicate that this idea of a relationship is permeated by God's communicative ability, his speaking, his conversation within the Trinity is now shared. And all these terms that are referred to by all the scholars are important to put together. We are called, we are, we are named, we are called to name, that's part of our vocation. Yahweh commands in his first recorded words of proper protection, don't eat of this tree. It is of consequence that Yahweh speaks creation into existence, but only speaks to humans. It's different. He's not speaking to creation. He's speaking to Adam and Eve. It's a proper dialogical approach. This is the beginning of a pervasive covenantal perspective. Some would call this a quasi-familial relationship. And others would say this pericope sounds almost like it's nuptial in its intimacy. It's like a marriage language is going on of offering oneself and receiving one, oneself in that kind of a life. Not just between Adam and Eve, but between Yahweh and his image. So, the context, communication, speaking to, the dynamic of that, the word itself that's, that's overflowing in, in creative dialogical power, incorporating covenantally these who are created. But then we find this, this remarkable outline. And yours is better than mine, but as I've gone over this, I have come back to the four major levels of relationship that I think are 
unmistakable. And you know them all, virtually by heart. The first one is that Adam is enjoined to rule. And that's not a negative word in the Bible. It's to rule fruitfully. It's to rule as God would. You know this, of course, as, as another kind of, of, of discussion of, of, the, of the kinds of things that we are called to be, to subdue it, to multiply and to fill. Secondly, we are called to work. Genesis 2, uh, God plants a garden where he places a man in the man, there he places the man whom he formed. God, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. The image is placed in that context for fruitful purposes. What others refer to as co-creativity. So co-reigning, co-regency, and co-creativity. And then you have choice. An astounding reality. They're the freedom given to the first couple to choose between good and evil. These are moral categories which God alone discerns and delineates. It is here that we see the calling into the character of God, enabled to reflect his holy goodness, to live in that goodness, which is himself. Although Adam does not determine what is right or wrong, his relationship, his conversation, his obedience to the voice of God, his trust in God, like in the Sabbath, as the good of his life, is the vocation where he reflects the moral likeness to, of God. Each of these first three marks indicate a progression Rule, work, choose. It's a progression of intimacy within the image and the creator. Showing more and more likeness, more and more intimacy of holy love. Each of these commands are part of the fulfillment of God's purposes for Adam. They are how a person is fulfilled. But they also describe a person's essence, who we are, what we're made for, even our function, what fulfills our lives but in a startling contrast to the preceding three commands, and they're all commands in Hebrew, you've got this fourth, which is not an injunction. It's a realization, which arises out of what God assesses as not good. Despite all the intellectual and functional excellence of Adam's stewardship, something is out of kilter. No matter how good he is, how holy he acts, something is missing. Adam's biggest need is another, which is not an animal, nor is it Yahweh. Now, why would that be? It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helpful su helper suitable for him. And there, here there is a decisive shift of focus. The first three are functional, measurable. But the last command is a realization that for true goodness to permeate creation, there must be a revelation, a reflection of the personal nature of God in himself as love for the other, I believe. Dominion, work, choice, moral choice, personal relationship. The marks themselves are all relational. If you think about it, you've got this astounding flow. You've got ruling, which is the God saying, tend created things as I would. Work means take, those, rule, take the things you're ruling over and do with them what reflects my original heart, what I want done with things. And here I want to say Francis Young's perceptive discernment of a Trinitarian underpinning in these three remarkable movements, which I many people mention because it is so insightful. But every time I read somebody talking about this, Young's insight, I think to myself, wait a minute, there's so much more. We've got to see every part of this carefully so that God speaks speech but he also makes, he fabricates, and then he fruitfully indwells. It's a Trinitarian reality. And Young is exactly right. Even working produces this, this Trinitarian offering of life. But that must be met with a moral use of things. Ruling through things must be done as God intends. Holiness and love always bring purpose, purpose, always bring fruitfulness, and always bring relationship in choice making. Humans are never apart from those three things. But yet there must be another. God never wanted to be everything to Adam. Never did he want to be that. Imaging God's life incorporates others. Individuality is unfulfilling without mutuality. At base, it may be said that nothing is to be used for self alone in the created order by its created overseers. Covenantal love images that reality in God. But there's more representing, manifesting his 
nature as co-heirs, co-workers, co-moral partners beyond command and incorporating an essential need which Yahweh does not fill. The image is made to be a co-relational. To be the image of God is to reflect all the other three, yes, but a fundamental need for another. To be a person is to need another. And that throws me off because everything about my culture says you must focus on who you are and know yourself and understand yourself and be able to outline your particular characteristics. Well, the Bible does none of that. It is fascinating to note that recognition of this necessary human inter interdependence also distinguishes the four marks from the others. For it is the mutual, selfless, responsible reciprocity which most reflects the internal essence of God himself. Yes, he works. Yes, he bears fruit. Yes, he is moral. But the creator is essentially internally related. And thus he says, I'll make that image, a man and a woman. Number four now, a holistic image of God. I don't know uh, if Tertullian helps us here in talking about uh, the image of God. Uh, he comes to this, this idea of, of relation, relational reality, which is revealed. Let me see if I can go through this quickly. It was because he had, already, he had already his son close at his side. This is God the Father. As the second person, his own word, and the third person also the spirit in the word, that he purposely adopted the plural phrase, let us make in our image, and become as one of us. So see, Tertullian is working the Trinitarian perspective even in these, in these first few verses. He sees the, thing, the same things we do. In what sense, however, you ought to understand him to be another? I've already explained. On the ground of personality, he says. Not substance. In the way of distinction, not division. I must everywhere hold on one only substance in three coherent and inseparable, and of course his discussion includes the word person, but not in this sentence, persons. Although every major theologian must address the issue of the image, I choose today John Wesley very quickly here. Over the years, I've found that no one in the West has grounded their theology more in the full arc of Scripture, from creation, loss of the image, to its recreation before the consummation of all things. I know of no other Western theologian who does it as completely as he does. Although much has been brought to the table regarding human personhood since he wrote, I find his, his historical placement, his responses to the dawning debate about self and body-soul relationship, historical critical methodology are very similar to ours, and I still find his, his outline compelling. Wesley on the structure of the image. Why does this lecture feel like this hour has gone so, as fast as the hour I was married? I cannot believe that we're almost done here. But uh, let me just quickly do this. Wesley advocates the political, which is his word for dominion or the cultural mandate. Then the natural. And if you want to read him, it takes a lot of reading to tie these things together, but you'll find every one of these words in his sermons. So he's deeply interested in the natural image, every aspect of finiteness, of incommunicable individuality. What's it mean to be an individual? He doesn't use the word incommunicable, but individuation, person. He's very intrigued by the whole idea of the corporeal body. What's it mean to be a physical body? All these, of course, supported by scriptural references to Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, to Hobbes on this corporeal thing, he says, reading Hobbes and Hume, I find in something in me that thinks. It's not a dichotomy. It is in me. I'm a thinking being responding to the separation of the philosophies of his day. Carl Henry, by the way, took grave reservation at the turn toward the body in Bart's anthropology, but uh, that's for another discussion. The mind as rational soul. So Wesley also sees it's not just body, but an act that's active without a soul. There's an inward principle, he called it, an essential movement of the Spirit of God in every person. Yahweh Elohim commands and expects response, which is rational and subjective, and cognitive, and understanding, reasoning, emotions, affections, speech, communication, all come under this category for him. Of course, the aspect of volition, freedom, the consonant of free, uh, free will. Nothing individualized where a center of self-enthronement for self-actualization. Self-will, freedom is rather not a Pelagian move, it's an articulation that the image reflects the nature of God in self-communication, in self-knowledge, in self-transcendence, and self-direction. Though not self-produced, this is nonetheless a created radical personal freedom, which many of you have, have dealt with in Wesley and others 
deeply. Spirituality, physical, spiritual relationship, even immortality of soul and body. All of these are are major parts of the political and the natural. Tipping my hat just a bit here, I'd argue that none of these are strictly individual characteristics. All of them are received, expressed, and realized in relationship. There is no individuation of a person that's truly Christian by itself, never alone. Even a perfect human being is not the image of God, not one human being. You can be perfect and not image his life. Yahweh never intended to image himself through one created human person. Adam's aloneness did not catch him by surprise. All that is discerned above is in direct relationship with God out of an absolute contingency on Adam's part. Nothing he possesses has come from him. It is all given to him. Edwin Lewis says it this way in one of his early books. The image is not self-originating, self-sustaining, self-fulfilling, or self-explanatory. That's an astoundingly helpful summarization. But we all know there's a couple more to go. There's a third element, and that is the moral. Like Luther and Calvin, Wesley emphasized the moral image. He repeated this theme from Ephesians 4, 24, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. A major focus for Wesley, as you well know. And this crucial portion of his theological anthropology is present everywhere. The restoration of the image of God prior to the eschatological existence of every believer. Wesley believed was the recreation of the moral image that could occur even before one met Jesus face to face. But all of this, all this morality comes out of, originates in divine love poured in by the Holy Spirit. It is never something we produce. It is always that which God offers. So in this connection between being and doing, which is very important, the ontological part, the essential structural part of the image, and now the functional, dominion, what we do in ethics, those kind of things. What is a relationship? Well, being must, for Wesley and for us, must precede function. No person simply is without relationship. And so the fourth level of the image, or mark of that, is the social, or the relational. I'm not going to defend Wesley here. We don't have time. I do want to say that even though he did not talk at length about this, he, I find that no one else in pastoral ministry seems to have applied these themes to their ministry, relational concepts, like Wesley did. And I think any pastor who is looking to encourage their people would take a a long look at Wesley's relational categories in ministry as an indication of how we image his life in the church today. The, uh, let me see if I can go ahead here. Dennis Kinlaw says it this way, uh, to be a person is to be incomplete, even to be a divine person is to be incomplete. And as shocking as that sentence is, the more I look at these uh, references to the image of God, I find that to be very close to reality and something I want to think through for a a long time. Person is a relational reality, as you say. Lastly, let me make point five my last point. The image of God as reflective of, of ultimate reality. To be a person is to be an embodied spirit, not the radical heretical dualism of ever present Gnosticisms, but a profound, non-reductive, holistic unity of body and spirit. The larger biblical witness becomes clear that it is not just a body-spirit unity that defines full personhood, but that the goal is a human person filled with the Holy Spirit. So at its best, after delineating the substantial structural elements to focus on the relational, which incorporates all other contextual elements. As I've been looking through this, I have found that Yahweh in, initiates an intimate, uniquely personal relationship. We've talked about that. The authority and providence of the Creator is mirrored in the in dominion and work of the image, yes. But we also find that the Holy Spirit enables, through His presence in people's lives, them to reflect the very face of God. And for several years, I've been looking at the uh, nearly 2,000 references to the word pana, or face, um, in, the, in the Old Testament. It's an astounding study. Uh, basically, panah means to turn, but panim, the plural of face, is what it means to have a countenance, to be turned toward another, of being face-to-face with another person, indicating at times the presence of a person, the face of a person, what they look like, what their face looks like. Think about all the references in the Old Testament to that. Much like prosopon in Greek, and its place in the Greek investigation of the psychology of the person. The Old Testament bears a strong indication 
of a progressive understanding of the person through just the word face. Vegan Gurian says it this way about Eve, the suitable helper, Etzer. He says, another way to translate that word is the one who is an opposite, the one who is turned toward Adam or facing him. That is his help, one who has a face-to-face relationship. Humans are created in the image of God. They are, we're embodied spiritual beings, responsible to community and to God, to form the framework for a deepening conception of human and divine persons to come. We are to live before him face-to-face, as friends, even mouth-to-mouth, as Moses has indicated in Deuteronomy. Persons possess faces for relationships. What does that mean? As representation of the creator, it is interesting to note the relationality inherent in each of the psychological categories. All of human life was to represent dependence upon another, on whether God or humans. Evil was the exact opposite, a catastrophic alienation a decimation of the image, a loss of the face. If a Hebrew person could be defined in isolation, one might find basic assistance in defining Imago Dei from an ontological relatedness. Now, I need to go on. I've done a lot of work as well with the word prosopon. Not as often, of course, in the New Testament, but it's also a very intriguing thing. And the more I look through this, I found that the early church had, I think, great wisdom in giving us these two terms. Prosopon, which indicates the eyes in Greek. Then we see the, the progression of these concepts moving through histrionic or, or the play, the, the, the drama world into individuals. Finding the Latin fathers, those who spoke Latin, uh, giving us other term, the other term. That would be persona. Notice you have two perspectives. You've got the eyes, prosopon, eye focus, and then you've got sound. Mouth-oriented, speaking at or talking to, communication. I don't know if they're better than one another, but I'm intrigued at the foundation of that pana idea, the face as being the, 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 the Christian understanding of the, what is revealed about God's own nature. And from that come two major analogies, um, one being the Augustinian and Thomistic one and the intrasubjective one, which I call... Uh, the, the, well, that is written about by Richard St. Victor, which is someone I'd love to talk about another time. So, in light of that, it seems to me that we are looking at a, a biblical perspective on relationality which is thoroughly under, undergirded by the church in all of its history. If I was able to go through the history of, of person, uh, early church, medieval, and modern, I think we'd find that uh, we've, not been help- we've been helped much by an ongoing discussion of, of the person. With this, let me close. The purpose of this marvelous three-year experiment in mutual discourse is to open up collegial lines of integrated inquiry. All of us must be grateful for that, and I personally am one. Philosophy, like science, assists biblical interpretation and consensual theology while acknowledging the limitations of human reasoning when compared to divine revelation. Biblical monotheism adumbrates and then clearly accentuates the Trinitarian oneness of God as a self-differentiated being without imposing so-called modern perceptions of individuality, person, on those distinctions. The persons of the Trinity are revealed to us as three specific self-conscious, perichoretic, mutually dependent, and self-giving persons in the oneness of being which pertains to God alone. Two things have happened in my life this year as I've been studying, thinking about your faces this morning that, uh, that clarified all this research and writing for me. One was the birth of our third grandson, Damon, a person whose conception began in the midst of a beautifully frenetic family of four already. But it became clear very early on that his personhood, that brilliant, silent child, of course he's brilliant, is taking everything in at an exhausting rate. He is not becoming a person. He is a relational being and has has been even from the womb. He is being formed by the gracious gifts of the love of a father, mother, brothers, and of course his grandparents who are here with you today. Receiving without being able to offer what we consider personal agency, rationality, no less a person whose very essence gives more than most active reasoning agents give to others over decades of life. As I put down my notes and turned toward uh, Chicago, my, our daughter was married uh, last Saturday, by the way. I'm still getting over the, the shock of that on a variety of levels. But after I began to think about all this talk, 
I brought a, after I got past my defensive fatherliness and to check with the Spirit's help, I thought how apropos that I'd be writing for these months and come to be with you with that backdrop. Because it is the same kind of backdrop that all the Scripture begins with. What we have here is a bestowal of love from love. What the first father of the bride desired was a mutual covenant of love that was evidenced by faithfulness, intimacy, trust, mutual encouragement, and passion. He did not demand a worship service in the garden. He offered his image, himself. The reality to which that image pointed is inscrutable, uncircumscribable, philosophically other. All right. But nonetheless, it is Yahweh's statement of incompleteness. It is his use of the plural pronoun us. It is his humility to produce by breath and removal these two creatures that are out of all creation, mirror, represent, act like him in time and space, in ecstatic covenantal union. I, for one, refuse to get caught up in the minutia of some of our mutual criticisms that I miss the reality that Jesus comes to produce in each of us, in his bride, a restored heart of selfless love, a rational, existential, existence, ecstatic love, if you will. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Yuri. That was uh, helpful, stimulating. Uh, there are some who speak for 20 minutes, and it seems like an hour. Uh, there are others who speak for an hour, and it seems like 20 minutes, and you're definitely the latter. And, and I can see why uh, Dr. McCall has admired you. Uh, uh, well, I'm afraid I'm going to spend some time this afternoon going back and looking at Panah. I, I, I saw, good, uh, good. You know, even this week, just reading uh, Ra'a plus Panah, you know, see the face. And that's, uh, yes. so I'm afraid you've ruined my afternoon <laughs> uh, for me. Uh, maybe I could begin with this question. And then uh, those of you who have questions, there are mics on each side. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we get questions uh, recorded, that everyone can hear those. Uh, we do have a number of uh, pastors and theologians who uh, are able to uh, view these later. So maybe I can begin with uh, this question. Uh, Dr. Yuri, what are some, some issues or, or situations where uh, those of us in pastoral ministry, somebody comes to us and says, I have this problem, I, I have this question, uh, what might be some of those uh, issues or questions specifically to which we could uh, apply this concept of imaging the image. I think it goes back to yeah. uh, you talking about applying these themes to our ministry. Maybe you, I, I know there are many, but what are some of the ones that that come to your mind first, or maybe that you've even done recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, that's a, that's a huge area, but let me just take a couple here. Um, for me, in ministry, it seems like the major question people are asking right now is about sexuality. Major questions. So I think that this this discussion has to be at least a part of our offering to people that we love. Um, uh, almost everywhere I turn, my own children, podcasts of uh, people, I, I'm hearing a lot of discussion. A lot of discussion, of course, pertaining to the creation of Adam and Eve and what that means. And that's why I would say that we need to be, make sure that we don't allow our discussion to ever move away from um, the, uh, what's the word I could use, the most... Uh, I don't want to say literalistic, but the most realistic reading of the text there, if we're going to actually have something to say to people about male-female relationships as God's primary, well, his created will for us as human persons. Um, I also think, though, that we have been so, we have so bought into the individuation program, which I began my, my lecture with, that most people have no idea about the, the absolute necessity of being related to others uh, in, for full personhood. So we're, we're, we actually believe that if I feed myself or do something for myself, that that in some way is going gonna, is gonna to fulfill my created purpose. And it's not wrong to love yourself. I think the scripture affirms that. But you can only do so in relationship. And that's my point, is that every aspect of humanity, if it's going to be fulfilling, is going to have to, is, has to be, by its nature, other-oriented. Um, so anything that I'm doing, giving, uh, uh, in ministry, anything I'm, I'm offering has got to be a, it's got to be an outflow, which I find in God's nature, but I also find that in, in in the created image, in Scripture. So those are those are two things that come to my mind. You may have something else on your mind that you're thinking about. No, those are very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, 
Joel has one over here, and if, if other somebody else wants to uh, take this mic. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Yes. Gary. Yes. Um, so I was struck in particular about uh, one of your emphases early on about uh, kind of the irreducible nature of personhood. Yes, um, yes. And so um, one account of uh, that's trying to square evolutionary theory with human origins and a theology of human origins um, views, it's at least flirting with the possibility that the image of God is something like an emergent property mm -hmm. where um, there's this very gradual over time um, growing moral awareness, growing ab like abilities for abstract thought, for communication, yes. for rationality. And so um, on this account, you've kind of got this um, long period of time where homo sapiens are gradually growing into the image. Mm -hmm. But it seems like yes. um, your account of the personal uh, nature of the image would have a problem with that because it seems like we, there's we don't want to say that there are quasi persons right it right. doesn't admit of grades right exactly yeah yeah I, I think you've read me correctly yeah. and I, I'm sure I can be taught and need to be taught from the other other school of thought but I, I come from a, a I think it's the traditional one <laughs> I was listening to a podcast uh, uh, in my age, I can't run anymore, so I have to walk to kind of stay healthy. So I'm walking, listening to podcasts, and uh, listen to one of those cool churches. You know, you have them here in Chicago, but the cool churches with thousands, you can tell thousands of people, and I'm sure the pastor had jeans on and, you know, all that stuff. And uh, in the middle of his, his discussion about Genesis, he said, uh, he said, be wary of those people who believe in a talking serpent. And there I was in the middle of my walk thinking, well, I think I've just been maligned by the pastor of this really cool church. I'm sure their snicker, which I heard, hundreds of people snickering, were laughing at people like me. So I guess I, guess I have moved beyond that. I, I still think there, after 2,500 years, um, there's still the option of thinking that, that, that God did make uh, Adam out of the dirt, the dust of the earth, the earth, which is interesting ephemerality. When you think about dust of the earth, it's less than dirt. It's like really dust, really nothingness. But um, I, see the, I, I see the argument. I, for me, again, my point is, though, when does that become personal? At what point? Right. right. And then have you lost something in all of that discussion and argumentation toward the process and progress? That's why the words bang uh, and hominid and other concepts, I'm willing to read all I can about and learn. I just feel like each of them augur a loss of the person. And my fear is that we're allowing too much of the discussion in to the loss of one of the major categories for all of human reality. Right. And that's, I mean, yeah. from my perspective, the emergent views got problems already because, yes. Yes. I mean, so they just gradually decide, eh, maybe cannibalism might not be a good idea. Right. And right. that's yeah. somehow the image. But it seems like your account, yeah. it really, it's a huge problem for that view. So mm -hmm. whatever... Our, a theologically robust, adequate account of the image mm. can't go that route yeah. because we lose personhood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to say again, I don't feel like I can go there, but I feel like I've been, I've been helped by the other schools of thought to think more dynamically about, about origins. I'm still not there, but I, I'm challenged. Yeah. I, I think this discussion, which I've been able to listen to and, and read from far away, has just been very healthy. Uh, I think that's the whole purpose of catalyzation, isn't it, to, to keep this discussion going. So I'm sure the thing I need to learn, but the point you pointed out, I simply cannot countenance yeah. anything but an instantaneous uh, creation yeah. for those very reasons. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Um, yeah, so I had a, a question going back to your interpretive issue at the very beginning. Yes. Um, so how we're moving from, at least what I, what I perceived from uh, kind of what you laid out from analogy and kind of from our way of knowing, yes, so yes. like a relational epistemology, right. how we move from that to a relational ontology, mm. uh, both in God and in, in humanity, if you could yeah. kind of clarify yeah. that move for me. Yeah, I, I did a lot of work in writing about that and realized we didn't have time in the hour to, to do that. I don't know if I'm the one to describe that to you. All my, my point was, though, the, the Christian community up until 
very recent, I think, has felt like the Scripture reveals to us in, term, in words ideas that you and I must, of course, think through epistemologically. How do we come to know things? What's revelation mean? Who's revealing? Is it a personal being who's revealing himself to us? And what do those concepts then mean for me? Or are we arguing from the other direction? I'm placing upon God things that I think would make an, a God that I understand. I understand the criticism, but I, I, I argue that the analogy vis-a-vis -vis people like, well, Aquinas would be a major one, but others, there is a, a reality that is offering himself to us in terms, and that, that epistemology comes out of a, a, an ontology. You don't have being, excuse me, you don't have communication or creation out of an impersonal being. It's a triune one who is offering himself. So any indication from his revealed word to us would automatically then allow us to have this careful, we need to be very careful, but we also need to be full, orbed in terms of the, of the relationality offered to us. We're not, off, we're not offered some monolithic monad. We're offered a dynamic Trinitarian life. And it begins from early on in scripture. I think they're first paragraphs. Now that's, it builds, we learn, and we have to have the pro progress, uh, but um, that's how I would argue it. Is that toward your question at all? Yes, actually that's yeah. very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. One question I've been trying to work through lately is how to think about theological anthropology, exactly the same we were talking about, looking at Genesis 1 and 2 relationally, yeah. um, and talk about singleness. Yes. Because you brought up right. um, like sexuality being a huge part of the conversation today. Mm -hmm. And yes. yet we're supposed to be relational. And so right. what about those in the church that God has called to a life of singleness? So Absolutely. my question is... Absolutely. Um, yeah. That you said Jesus is the, the fullness of the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. Yes. Um, we see the image of God most clearly in Jesus. And then also, yes. God says it is not good for Adam to be alone. And then you said God made Adam and Eve to be co-creators, co-workers, co-laborers yes. in a covenantal relationship. It's nuptial together. Yes. But Jesus wasn't married. Right. So, I, so I'm trying to work out how, how to fit any of that together. It okay. seems almost, it's not a contradiction. I get this, no. it's not, no. but no. I, I can't Thank you. figure it out. That's excellent. And I don't know, maybe, I'm sure you can help me. By the way, thanks for listening so carefully. You quoted back an outline to me, it's, it's marvelous. You're you use a lot of adjectives and predicate <laughs> nominatives. I love it. <laughs> you're, you're brilliant. Uh, for me, I would say that the image is always a symbol, a symbol of reality. The image is not reality. We image reality. So Jesus came as a single man, but he was of reality. So he never ever lived a second of his existence apart from another. So Father and Spirit are trinitarily connected to him forever and ever. So he is always from and for another in that sense. And any single person, I would say, can move right to the reality of knowing God, imaging that life in love without reserve. I mean, Huge sections of the church have been single people who have been fulfilled in love and pouring out with holy love without, without any qualm. But they're never to be alone in that. So married love may be the symbol that God chose, but it's not the only way people live. We can participate in, you said Jesus is not married, but he is in one sense. He's married to us. We are his bride. So those concepts of ultimate fulfillment are going to change even for us who are dyadic and male femaleless. We're, we're moving towards something even transcending that, apparently, when we get to see him face to face. So it, 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 it seems to me like it's not a separation, like somebody's better. It's saying this is God's chosen created image, but all of us are called to the reality of knowing him fully and relating to others in self-giving love, receiving and giving love. And that's the place where married couples can blow up and single people can miss their purpose in life by not understanding the full nature of who they are. So uh, single people are just as fulfilled, just as, as imaging the life of God as, as anybody does. But God did ordain this one image to show us something about the mutuality and the dyadic nature, the differentiation needed in life that, uh, that he alone describes. So that's a stab at a very important question. Thanks. Helpful at all, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. 
Thank you, Professor Yuri, yes. for that wonderful talk. Uh, very sympathetic to your um, to your overall message. I think Colin Gunton was one person who speaks a similar uh, concern, and um, very drawn to him because of the way he was identifying certain sets of concerns. Now, who's that? Colin Gunton. Oh, Colin. Yeah. So I can <laughs> right. see. I'm I'm sure yeah. you're not unfamiliar with his work. Um, yes. Oh, I love so Gunton. Very. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the work. I also very much enjoyed uh, your reference to your sort of creative take on what likeness refers to. Hmm. Um, I'd be interested to hear how various Old Testament scholars would receive that. But it seems like you have yeah. support for some of their A and E readings and the difference in Genesis. Yeah. which could also corroborate with um, traditional dogmatic uh, convictions about this distinction between God and creation. So, uh, yeah, and there's yeah. much more I could say, but let me just quickly yeah. give uh, one commendation to you and then one question. Um, your lecture reminded me very much of um, Craig Bartholomew's talk last year on the goodness of creation. Mm -hmm. And in particular, mm -hmm. in his talk, yes. he was referring yes. to one book that I can't remember the title on, but yes. talked about the God, the seeing God of Genesis. Yes. And I think especially with the stuff you were saying with face yes. and this yes. book of seeing yes. remind me a lot. I, I left that lecture thinking that Genesis gives us a pedagogy of sight, that we image God by seeing mm. as he sees. Mm. So I think you might enjoy that and you'd be able to find oh, it. Oh, I've heard it. Oh, oh you have? Okay. It's, so you might know the book that I'm talking it's, about as well. I, I, I can't. My mind's blanking out, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, it's um, wonderful. Excellent. And then a yeah. uh, question for you. Um, Quite frequently, relational uh, accounts of the image, you might be comfortable with the language of relational ontology. Absolutely. Are juxtaposed yeah. or contrasted with uh, nature accounts or substance accounts of yes. the human person. Yes. Um, yes. I guess my question would be, do you think that that is a valid um, contrast between mm. sort of nature accounts and relational accounts? Yeah. Uh, and if not, then how do you see the two as compatible with one yeah. another? Yeah. And why do you think it's wrong? Um, to do the contrast as so frequently right. they pair. And yes. I think that that question is in especially pertinent in these science theology conversations because a lot of times people act like the relational account allows you to sidestep all the physical questions uh -huh. and just talk about interpersonal relations. Ah, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, so yeah, my question correct. again, how do you relate the, the, yes. phys the natural account with the relational yeah, account? Thank you. Well, Jeffrey, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. I was trying to do that in my discussion of the marks of the image. And that's why I did that thing on Wesley, just to say there are, it's important to look at all these structural elements, which we all, of course, need to be aware of. And they're, they're created, they're important. But my, my, my take is, on, on reading the, the emphasis on science in our, in our modern era, is that it pushes us more into an individuation account, rather than saying, how, and I didn't have time to do it all, how would all of those, how could all those be seen as relational categories that none, my conscious, self-conscious, really is nothing without you? I mean, what would it be if I had nothing but myself, singleness, nothing but myself, how would I, how would I be self-conscious? I think the argument is you wouldn't be. You'd, go, you'd lose your mind. So, and the same thing for every aspect. Uh, uh, any aspect of the mind, conversation, choice making, it's all related. So I think the two must go together. In fact, I would argue for a relational ontology as a foundation of a structure or nature ontology. That gives meaning to nature. Look at all those aspects. My concern is the nature discussion seems to pull us off into characteristic debates, and we lose the, the essence of personal reality, which is the ultimate reflection of God. You have to have the other elements. But like I started with my own grandson, he may not be able to communicate like you and me, but he communicates at, at a much deeper level as well. So humanly, relationally, we're, we're talking about some things that, that must be a part, especially of a Christian anthrop anthropology, if we're going to offer something that's, that's meaningful and cogent and, and profitable in the way I believe science is pushing us. Um, uh, the depersonalization of, of, of modern culture is what I'm deeply concerned about. The, the, the loss of the person, the death of the person, and, and the preoccupation with the self. So uh, that's kind of where I am. Supportive, the relational supports the, the natural. I don't, I'd hate for it to go as opposed to each other. I think that's a real, real unhelpful move. Am I, yeah. I, I agree with you, yeah. it just seems to dominate the dominant position. So people who yes. relationality often do so in a way that supposedly sets it against yeah. Nature accounts. And the people yeah. who hold nature accounts tend to set yes. act like it's um, superior to relational accounts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, of course, my position isn't always the best, the right one, but uh, uh, yeah. No, I, I think the discussion is good. I think, I, I think you're right. I, that tone thing, I've also picked up in my listening to lectures over the last year. I think we need to watch our tone. And forgive me if I, my tone's been poor uh, on anyone. Uh, I want to learn. I can disagree. I think there's still heresy in the church. We can say that's heretical. That's just wrong. But on, up to that point, we need to be able to listen, to talk. I've learned a lot of, and reading about, from the nature side of things that you described. I learned a lot this year. But um, nothing convinced me at the end that what they were talking about was a full person. It seemed to be more individuated more solipsistically leaning, narcissistically leaning, and not the connectedness that I think is reflective of all ultimate reality in, in, in the triune God. So that may be something I need to be trained better on, but that's where I, I am. So thank you for a great question. Dr. Yuri, this is so helpful. Thank you so much. Let thank me uh, close us in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the creator. We thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made uh, created in your image, created in love. And I pray that you will help us by your spirit as we think about how uh, these concepts uh, come to bear in our ministries as we deal with uh, beginning of life issues, end of life issues, uh, sexuality, so many other aspects. Lord, would you help us to, uh, to uh, work out uh, these concepts in, in our lives and in our ministries. Again, we thank you for Dr. and Mrs. Yuri. Pray for your blessing on them. Uh, we commit them to you and to your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.